Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending uh, today's seminar. We are going to do some uh, show preparation here with the PGA show. We're very fortunate to have uh, a very esteemed group of uh, section honorees in merchandising and club fitting and teaching with us this morning, as well as a, a gentleman from PGA Golf Exhibitions. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind you that next Tuesday, we're going to have a decade of junior development with uh, both uh, James Hong and Jeff Smith, who is a top 50 teacher and a friend of ours from Indiana. And so uh, put that on your calendar. Then that'll be it for the week. The following week is PGA Show Week. So we're taking a week off. And then after the show in February, we're gonna have like a show recap. So any of you who are attending the seminar this morning, if you're going to the show and you see a product of any kind, it doesn't matter what it is, we'd like to know about it if you're impressed with it, all right? Because uh, after the show, we'd like to, like to do a seminar on what people found interesting, you know, from apparel to technology, to, to clubs, to club fitting. So anything at all, just you know, take, make some notes and, and contact us and we'd like to get you involved in that, uh, that seminar coming up. So uh, this morning, we've got Sam Wiley, who is a, a multiple award winner here with us in the PGA section. Sam was a merchandiser of the year, as well as a Bill Strasbaugh award winner. Uh, Coker Gorey was a teacher of the year. And also he had won the Gil McNally award. And then uh, Katie Weedmer from Wingfoot is our 2021 uh, Merchandiser of the Year. And uh, I, I had met Katie for the first time on the night she received her award. To my knowledge, Katie is the first non-head professional ever to win that award in our section. So that's very impressive. And uh, one of the things I was most impressed with that evening with Katie was that she just owned the room with her speech. She was very, uh, she was very funny. She was uh, very respectful of Wingfoot and its membership. And just, you know, uh, I was truly impressed with Katie and, and made a note in my phone that night that, you know, this is a young woman I'd love to get in, involved with our section. So uh, thank you, Katie, for being with us this morning. Uh, obviously, Sam's going to lead us off here. And uh, we also have Mark Simon, who is with the uh, PGA Golf Exhibitions. And Mark has been kind enough to come on. And between uh, what Mark knows about all the registrations and you know uh, groups that are going to be there, close to 600 companies, we have up-to-date information. Kirk has been in contact with a lot of the vendors and the equipment companies, you know, due to the work that he does with Pete's Golf, and he has up-to-date information. So we probably have the best information, the most updated information of any section in the country. And so, Sam, I'd like to turn it over to you at this time so that you can uh, lead us on. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just due to Mark's time constraints as we get closer to the PGA show, he's certainly incredibly busy um, trying to put the last minute details together. So I'm going to cede my time at this point to Mark and Mark will kind of go over everything that's taking place and we'll, we'll be available for Q&A um, as we go through and at the finish of his presentation. And because he is going to have to jump off any further questions that may come up during the rest of our uh, morning, I can take care of and uh, I can give you Mark's contact information and you can send him an email. So uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to uh, Mark Simon, exec Executive Vice President of PJ Golf Exhibitions. Thank you so much, Sam. And again, thank you uh, everybody for joining today. We really appreciate it. You know, you know, over the past 20, 20 months, how hard everybody's been working. You know, I hear firsthand from Sam, <laughs> you know, the long hours. And again, I grew up in the golf industry. My dad attended the show for many, many years. Uh, worked under two really fine PGA professionals in the Central New York section. And know in a normal year, you know, how much work go, goes into everything. Just wanted to thank everybody for their time, their support. And um, for today, I'm going to take about 15 minutes to go through a general show update. We'll talk about what the show is going to look like. Um, we'll share some stats and numbers. We'll review some of the features and special events, and what's new. Talk a little bit about education and employment, as well as give kind of the latest health and safety update as well. And then definitely going to leave time for questions at the end. Um, you can ask me anything and I'll answer as best I can. And um, 
you know, our team is working as hard as we can right now to put together uh, the best show that we can for PGA professionals under, uh, you know, very challenging circumstances. So, you know, to start off just with a general show update, you know, we know that so much has changed in the last 20 months, um, you know, in the world, in the golf industry. And I think it's no surprise that uh, the show is going to be very different. A lot of change this year. Everybody knows that we went to an all virtual format in 2021. We're really excited to be back in person for the 2022 show and excited to welcome PGA professionals, buyers and the industry back to Orlando um, in a few weeks. Now we do have experience uh, with other events that have come back in other industries. And we found that at, at those events, um, you know, what's really been the most surprising is just the excitement, the enthusiasm, the camaraderie from people that do attend. Um, being able to connect with their peers from around the country to share best practices, to commiserate on what they're going through, and to learn and to educate themselves. It's really been uh, rewarding to, to reunite those industries. So we're excited to do that in golf. Um, you know, again, we're going to focus this year on equipping PGA professionals with the tools that they need, again, to adapt, to thrive, to acquire new skill sets, to educate themselves, and to be the best that they can be as we take advantage of some of these dynamics that have been really positive for golf, but that have also put a strain, again, on the amount of work and the time um, that PGA professionals put in. So again, we're really excited to be back in person. Um, you know, in terms of what the show will look like and what's gonna be different in stats and numbers. Uh, first of all, I don't know if many people know, but the official name of the show uh, has changed from the PGA merchandise show just to the PGA show. Um, I think that's what people refer it to anyway. Uh, it's about so much more than merchandise. Um, so you're going to see a new look and feel, um, you know, a new entrance area, a new uh, logo. Um, so I think that's the first thing that's going to be really interesting when you come into the convention center. Um, and, and again, you know, we're, we're completely transparent. We, well, a lot of the largest and, and most recognizable brands in the industry, um, those that usually have the biggest, most dynamic displays uh, will not be able to participate this year due to COVID challenges. And we're excited to say that all of them have recommitted that they'll be back in 2023. And at the same time, we still have over 600, uh, or close to 600 exhibitors that are committed and that are there. And just for comparison, in a normal year, we would have around 800 to 850 exhibitors. So we're still close to 75% to, to 80% of the number of exhibitors that are there. And I think what you'll see this year is smaller displays, I think less bells and whistles on the display, and the focus is on the product and efficient needs. So I think you'll definitely see a lot less of the larger builds, and you'll see exhibits that are focused really on the product and how do we meet efficient. There's close to 200 new companies in the show this year as well, so we're going to see a lot of innovative new product, and um, you know we're excited by that the number you know, new companies and new products and new vendors that will be there. In terms of the size and scope of the show, um, the show is going to be about half the size in terms of the footprint that you would normally see, um, but still taking up probably about two thirds of the West Concourse of the Orange County Convention Center. So still a sizable event, just a lot smaller exhibits than we would normally have. In terms of attendance, you know, we look at, you know, we look at attendance every day. Um, we're probably anticipating about 50 to 60 percent of the normal attendance that we would get. Um, we'll, we look at we look at not just registrations, but things such as hotel pickup. Um, you know, we're past most of the points where hotel rooms could be canceled. There's over 60 percent of the hotel nights secured this year compared to the 2020 ship. So that's reassuring in terms of the amount of people um, that will be attending. Um, but again, you'll see just a very different looking, um, definitely a smaller show. Um, but with what we think will be a really effective bridge and transition to, to a more normal um, event in 2023. Um, as far as this, the features and special events at the show, you know, Demo Day, which traditionally is all about equipment product testing, has now been renamed uh, the PGA Show Demo and Fitting Day. And there's much more of a focus now on, again, instruction. Uh, there's a new PGA professional fitting team focus completely on fitting and you'll hear from experts in fitting there. We've expanded our instructional workshops. There's still over 50 vendors, but again, a mix of equipment and other product types that lend themselves to kind of outdoor demonstrations. Uh, we're excited to, to, to announce it looks like Golds of Honor is going to be coming in and doing a PGA professional uh, appreciation happy hour in the last couple of hours of, of demo day. 
that's kind of in the works, but hopefully it will be announced over the next couple of days. And there's other activations, fitness activations, a golf cart test track, and we still are using the entire Orange County uh, national 360 degree range. So it'll be very different than what it's been in the past, but still hopefully an effective uh, forum for people with questions. Working our way inside to the convention center, uh, you'll see some of the, the usual favorites, the new product center, which will offer a preview of all the new products being uh, displayed at the show. The fashion show uh, will be taking place on opening night this year on Wednesday evening to allow buyers and PGA professionals the opportunity to preview lines and then actually see them um, during the show on Thursday and Friday. We're really excited for a new, uh, brand new PGA of America hub that will be featuring, uh, again, a number of activations uh, focused on PGA partners, PGA programs, uh, PGA coach, make out the thing, the industry stage presentations. Uh, the stage is actually moved to within the PGA hub. And the PGA hub is actually right as you walk into the show floor and the doors open. So it's a great, uh, I think it's going to shine a light again on the PGA of America, a lot of the new programs and initiatives, as well as partnerships. Um, the opening ceremony is going to be new and reformatted. Uh, it looks like we're going to be announcing the PGA award winners uh, during the opening ceremony. We're bringing in Sam Harrop from overseas. I don't know if many of you know him, but he does a lot of the, the tour player parody songs. He's going to be playing and debuting some new material uh, in the lobby during opening morning. And then in terms of education, again, I know, we know education is really, really important, um, a key component to the show, but based on feedback, We've actually reformatted the education program, streamlined it, and then have a lot less overlapping hours with the show floor so that PGA professionals and buyers can focus their time on the show floor, but still partake in education. Again, the education has moved to Thursday afternoon and Friday. There's also sessions on Tuesday, but we tried to keep Wednesday and Thursday morning open so that, again, pros and buyers can focus their time with the exhibitors on the show floor. Uh, you know, you know, the, the tracks are going to be, of course, associated and tied to the PGA career tracks, the teaching and coaching, executive management, and golf operations. The AGM is also partnered and has a retail track. So really interesting and informative sessions are developed by Gauze, Todd, and the PGA education team. Um, we also have partnered again with the NGCOA. Uh, their golf business conference will be alongside the show, and we'll have over 300 uh, golf course owners. Uh, attending, and they have two special sessions on Wednesday uh, during the show that are open to PGA professionals, and they have a lunch in with Monica Sorenstam, and it's also, uh, I think tickets are available to purchase for that. Uh, in terms of career employment uh, and employment opportunities, again, uh, within the PGA Member Business Center, there will be PGA employment consultants on hand. The PGM schools uh, will also uh, be activating on the show floor. We have almost every school committed to be there and to participate. And we've also added additional lounge spaces on the show floor to offer opportunities for people to do interviews, to network, and to have enough space to connect with people that may be interested in, in employment at their facility. Um, this will be a bridge to a career fair that we'll be launching for the 2023 uh, show. And then I know I'm going fast here, but I want to leave time for questions. Um, you know, finally, you know, a lot of a lot of people have asked about health and safety and kind of the parameters and protocols that are in place. Um, you know, we do have a very detailed list of protocols listed right when you go to pgashow.com. It's the official website. Right at the top, you'll see health and safety protocols. We are requiring face coverings for all attendees indoors, uh, not at Denver. And uh, I did want to reiterate that the Orange County Convention Center is a GVAC certified facility. It was the first of its kind to receive that certification. And that's for the highest standards of cleanliness, sanitation, and air quality. Um, there's also, you know, of course, uh, you know, ample signage, uh, distancing will be in place in some areas, and there's a, a daily health and safety acknowledgement that everybody has to adhere by um, each day of the show. So more details on the website. And again, at pgashow.com, you'll see a full list of exhibitors. So you can check the exhibitor list to see who's committed to participate. Uh, the education conference schedule is posted. Pretty much every information, hopefully all the information you need can be found on the website. But again, as Sam mentioned, uh, I'm going to open it up shortly for a Q&A and can also take questions at any point uh, via email um, after the fact. Uh, if anybody wants to talk, um, I'm happy to call anybody later today or tomorrow to also answer any questions. So um, 
that was a lot of information in a short period of time. Hopefully it was informative. Um, I'm gonna open it up to anybody who wants to ask any questions. Hey, Mark, John Hobbins here. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate having you and giving us what is probably the, the best update that any golf professional in the country has at this moment. Uh, a couple housekeeping things. What are, uh, for the golf professionals, what are the show hours going to be? Yep, great question. And uh, again, uh, the show hours on demo day, which is Tuesday, January 25th, are from nine to five. And again, noting that we're gonna have a PGA professional appreciation happy hour from three to five at the end of the event. Um, show hours uh, from Wednesday through Friday, 8.30 to six on Wednesday, 8.30 to six on Thursday. And note that we have shortened the hours on Friday. Um, they are 8.30 to one. We wanted to offer the exhibitors that are gonna be there ample time to break down, not to have to have overtime charges on Saturday. And for those that want to fly out and make sure they have plenty of time to do whatever they need to do uh, to get home for the weekend, um, that is a change this year. Good. And um, obviously, you and your staff uh, are, like everybody else in the industry, has gone through unprecedented times. And what is it about the show this year that you're most excited about uh, in bringing it back live to us? Which yeah, I think there's two. That's the thing that you're most impressed with and, and most happy to be doing. Yeah, I think I think that's a great uh, great question. Um, again, we're here to serve PGA professionals, and I think what we're most excited about this year is how many you know the opportunities for PGA professionals that come to the show this year. Between seeing close to six hundred vendors, you know, we're really surprised that we've been able to retain that many exhibitors and also offer close to two hundred new companies. Um, so we're very close to numbers in terms of exhibitors at, at the previous year shows. But then when you also add the education opportunities the networking opportunities. We saw firsthand, again, at the other industry shows that have come back, how excited people are to be back together. Um, a lot of people are getting together on a regional level now, but not necessarily on a national level. So that's one of the great things about the PGA show, you know, walking down the aisle, coming into that pro that we knew five years ago or six years ago from across the country. And we're excited that registration is so strong right now. And I think that the networking opportunities, the education opportunities, and ways for PGA pros to connect with their peers um, I don't think you're going to see too much of a change with that this year. I think you might see even more excitement and enthusiasm for people to be back together. Yeah, from a from a selfish standpoint, I'm I'm excited because I think I'm going to get more time with the people that I want to see, and uh, and that's you know that's the reason I'm there. Yeah, I think with a smaller show and with less people, you know, we've all experienced this when you're supposed to be in four places at once and you're running from one end to of the convention center to another. I think with a little bit smaller footprint with less vendors and I think with more of the focus on meetings, I think you could absolutely spend more time with vendors and also with your fellow PGA professionals. Yeah, I've reached a stage in life where I can't run from one end to the other anymore. It's just <laughs> too big for me. Any other questions from Mark here? This is a, a wonderful opportunity to get the best information of, of anybody anywhere in the country right now. Mark, this hey, is Sam. This morning. Must have done a great job there, Mark. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just and again, I'll reiterate. Sometimes, I mean, I'm sometimes when I'm in large forums like this, I won't ask a question when I have one. So I'm, I'm very happy to. If anybody wants to email me, Sam's going to forward the information. Uh, if anybody wants to provide their phone number and talk through anything, I'll, again, I'll answer any question as best as I can, and I'm happy to help. And, and we're here, and our team is working so hard for PGA professionals and to support the industry and we can't be more excited to be back together in a couple of weeks in Orlando. Yeah, I just want to say, Mark, this is Sam. I just want to say thank you again for uh, your time this morning and sharing with us. I think yeah, you've obviously, just like all of us have been through a lot. I, you know, last year was a challenge trying to go from a traditional show in 2020 to a virtual show in 2021. And now we're back in person and I think it's exciting and I, I'm certainly committed and want to support it and look forward to um, the opportunity to get back down there to Orlando. I've only missed one PGA show and I was on some of the virtual last year, but I, I think there is an opportunity uh, for golf professionals to really get to uh, see some new vendors and an opportunity, as John said, to spend more time with those vendors and, uh, and reconnect with old friends and other people in the industry. So thanks again for taking the time to be here today. Yeah, I know there's got to be more questions. So uh, definitely email Sam or, or Sam if you send my contact you know, my contact information. Happy to Mark, I, I, I'd like to ask you a question. 
Sure. Um, I just, how many other shows have you done in the last six, six months? That, that's a great question. Uh, so Reed Exhibitions uh, has produced 23 shows over the last six months uh, in various industries. And at the Orange County Convention Center, you know, there, there's been uh, you know, close to 100 shows uh, this year, attracting 700,000 attendees. So the exhibitions industry is back. A lot of the shows look very different than they have previously. And, you know, as we stated before, uh, you know, a really significant bridge to hopefully a more normal event the following year. But I think what's been most exciting is just the camaraderie and kind of the pure networking and the best practice sharing that we see when industries come back together after being apart for so long. You know, what, what, what I'm trying to envision is myself being there. Um, and I think uh, between the protocols that I have set up with the Orange County Convention Center are impressive and great, and people are going to be masked. Um, I'm curious about uh, maybe some of the experiences socially that, that, you know, is really one of the keys to, to the show is seeing people, seeing people afterwards that there's, um, are there any gatherings that, you know, one of the popular things that, that, that happens at the show is um, uh, Summit Brands might, you know, host a cocktail party in, in the, you know, at their booth. Um, I'm, I'm just curious as to like some of that social stuff. And then even from, from your point of view, uh, what are people doing afterwards? Are they, are, are they going across the street to the bar? Or that's kind of not doing it. They, they, are, are they going to the thing, then kind of going to their corner just so they have limited uh, uh, FaceTime with people? Yeah, I think, you know, that's really, really great question. Um, again, you're definitely going to see, um, you know, we, you know, allow receptions to take place starting at four. You're definitely going to see that on the show floor. Um, and again, as in restaurant settings today, you know, obviously face coverings are not required if you're beverage settings where you're, you're eating and drinking. Uh, that's uh, definitely an important component to the show. Um, and other shows that have taken place, uh, you know, it's really kind of a personal decision based on what everybody feels comfortable with. We're still seeing that, you know, the bars, we had a show actually in Orlando and the Rocks Bar at the Peabody, or the Hyatt, I should say, still call it the Peabody. Yeah. Years, but uh, the, the Rocks Bar, you know, the Rosen Center Lobby Bar, they're still crowded. People are networking, and one of the great things about the show is those, you know, are those networking opportunities after yeah. hours. You're still going to see a lot of those things happen, and kind of in your day-to-day -day life right now, it's your comfort level. I'm going out to restaurants, yeah. going to nightclubs, and I think we're still going to see, you know, some good crowds at those, you know, at those facilities, and hopefully people adhere to what they need to from a health and safety perspective. But again, that's up to each person's kind of comfort level. But we are seeing that, and we're seeing a lot of networking and after all those events and other shows as well. That's great. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll, again, we'll take any other questions. Again, wanted to, before I jump, just thank you know all the PJ professionals um, for your hard work, for your support of the show. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, or if you have any suggestions for us, I'm happy, happy to talk. And, to take any questions and again, just wanted to thank everybody so much for your time this morning. Mark, we appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you in Orlando. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks Mark, for being with us. Thanks for being. Bye bye. John, do you want me to uh, to kick off or Katie or? Yes, please go right ahead. Your seminar. Okay. Uh, again, good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about what my typical year would look like for a PGA show and my preparation and, and kind of how I go through the week. And then obviously we'll talk a little bit about 2022, but I think it's kind of important to start with a, a more traditional year and kind of that preparation. Um, in my case, I typically will have three to four of my staff members attend. They're, they're given a budget to, to fly and for hotels and for food and so forth. Um, my booking of appointments typically would begin in December, trying to get ahead of the rush, um, trying to make sure that I get the appointments with the vendors uh, that I want to most see. Uh, typically, we book our staff dinner, that type of thing. Uh, and how I go about kind of setting my schedule is using the PGA Show app, which again, I'm using obviously in 2022, but it, it gives me an opportunity. I'll take that app and I will go from A to Z with every company in there and kind of look and see um, what companies that obviously star and favorite, the ones I, that I know and that I'm planning on booking. And then obviously if there's some other things out there, other vendors or exhibitors um, that I find 
interesting. I'll, I'll read a little bit more about them and then obviously identify them as well. I'm going to uh, share my screen here for just a, a minute with kind of what that looks like. And any of my staff members will get a kick out of it because they're the ones that help put it into kind of this Excel, you know, NFL type template. But uh, let me go ahead and do that now. That pop up for everybody. Yep, we can see it, Sam. Perfect. Thanks, Caitlin. So, again, I'll, I lay out my schedule from kind of morning till night, uh, from my arrival to to dinners, etc. And again, I do this so that one, I'm organized. I know where my appointments are. I do try to leave a little bit of time at various points to walk the show floor. Um, but again, it's just as much for anybody from my staff to kind of see what, what we're doing and, or where I'm going to be at any point in the day. So kind of the bottom half of this is, is really my staff assignments. And these are assignments for each of my staff that are attending for each day. And again, I break these out. Obviously I include myself down the left column and then we'll break out various staff members by kind of what, what they're up to for the, for the week. So um, in this particular case, uh, Lori is our golf shop manager. She's at list at the bottom. A lot of times I'll assign aisles. So everybody is given aisles to kind of really just go back and forth and really look at current and new vendors. Lori in that case was boost 40, 4,000 or 7,000. Again, looking mainly at our soft goods. Uh, vendors and certainly accessories. Um, in this scenario, uh, James is looking through the hard goods, kind of instruction, training aids area. Uh, Justin was looking at miscellaneous soft goods, accessories. Pat was looking at launch monitors, range finders, again, miscellaneous. And then I have a, um, a designation for all. And, and what that is, is it's really kind of the, you know, helping us pick out sunglasses, looking again at accessories, tournament operation or management software, um, launch monitors, et cetera. So that's kind of down there at the bottom. One of the other uh, unique things that I try to do, and maybe it's not that unique, but I, I give my staff members up to $1,500 that they can go identify products on their own, um, products that they're going to um, vet, promote, and sell through. So it gives them an opportunity to, to own something, have responsibility. And, you know, they may come back with me and talk about it. They may talk amongst themselves, but it gives them an opportunity to kind of get more actively involved in it. So that's a little bit of kind of like what a typical year would look like. Um, this year obviously is not a typical year, but like I said, in my kind of early discussion with Mark, I went through the same PGA show app. I've identified the vendors and the exhibitors that I want to meet with. I certainly will, um, this year will give us an opportunity, all of us an opportunity to walk the aisles. So one of the things I love to do is truly walk the aisles. And so I've booked very few appointments, uh, again, without the, the major manufacturers, without a lot of the large uh, soft goods companies there too. It just gives me an opportunity to, to identify um, some of the, those new people that I'm looking for. I think one thing that, um, you know, most of our buying probably in, for most of us in this area is done in the fall as we kind of enter into spring and certainly into kind of early summer. One of the things that I'd hope to like to see is a, um, a little bit more of a presence of our vendors at, at the Vegas show. I think that would be an important show for us to kind of um, gain efficiencies by trying to meet with our vendors over a shorter period of time. And, um, you know, again, this, this buy kind of down in Orlando is more about kind of that, that fall. And I'm looking in my particular situation, looking more for um, lifestyle type pieces. Yes, there is some, um, soft goods buy for kind of the summer months. But again, I look for things that are non-traditional in golf as I, as I use uh, Orlando. 
but that's uh, that's a little overview of kind of how I attack a PGA show and um, how I prepare for it and how I kind of divvy out responsibilities. And um, you know, I think we'll have more to talk about as as Kirk and Katie go through, and then we can kind of circle back on some things. But um, does anybody have any questions about how I may look at things and how I may do it? Or if there's anything, again, I think one of the great things about these forums is if there's any other best practices out there that people are willing to share um, to help us all get better. Hey, Sam, relative to your, uh, your staff, how important is it is for you that they have that responsibility and that you, you, you fund them so many dollars to, to pick a product and see it through? How, how's all that, how has all that evolved into your training of your associates? I think that's a good question. I think that, you know, one of the things I try to do is uh, divide responsibilities amongst all the staff members throughout the year. And I wrote those, rotate those responsibilities annually. Uh, I think that gives my staff um, the opportunity to really make decisions on their own, own those decisions, be able to support why they make those decisions. And uh, this is really just an extrapolation of doing all of that. I think it's uh, critically important that they participate. Each of my staff is given uh, at least one hard goods and, and one soft goods vendor that they are responsible for. For. And what, again, that looks like is they're the ones that'll look at uh, sell through how many units we've sold, how many units remain and making decisions for the upcoming buy. And they will help write those orders for me. It's, it's all training really to be able to take what their experiences are at Weburn uh, working in all these areas and to make a seamless transition into their own at professional jobs. You know, one of the things that's always impressed me about your shop is it's not a very big shop square footage wise. And but anytime I've walked into your shop, whether it be spring, summer or fall, I always know what season it is. I've always thought that you and your staff do a really good job of transitioning from one season to the next. And that you you have things in your shop that I never see in other shops. So you have a very unique approach into knowing your membership and, and knowing what they like and what will sell. And uh, I would encourage any golf professional out there who wants to do a better job in their shop is to, to get hold of Sam and, and at some point, you know, visit Sam's shop and just see how he goes about this because it's, it's always very representative of the season at hand. And uh, I, I particularly like your fall season and your Berber coats and things like that. You've always done a great job with that. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, no, I, I realized long ago that I can only sell so many golf shirts here um, I don't have the benefit of a Monday outing every week. I don't have the benefit of um, one member, three guests teeing off every group. So um, we did undergo a logo change for 2021, and that was a huge success. Um, it was club driven, but certainly our operation was a beneficiary of it. And um, we had an incredible season of that. And again, kudos to my staff. Uh, they did a great job, and Justin Lawler did an exceptional job of really chasing that inventory and getting ahead of like some key pieces and reordering, and, and we really uh, benefited from that. But again, as John said, years ago, I realized I could only sell so many golf shirts, and so, you know, starting by around September 1st, my golf shop definitely transitions to more of a lifestyle. Yeah, I do keep you know outerwear pieces in the golf shop but um we do use a number of different fenders um from golf and outside of golf and um and that really has allowed us to continue to grow our business hey, sam sorry john can i just jump in really quick? i want to go back to your uh your offensive coordinator uh, uh sheet there um you know i couldn't help but notice when you had the screen up uh the number of met section partner companies that that happened to be you know on your list and you know, I'm not sure whether there's a lot of method to that or if it just is, is you know, circumstantial that you happen to do a business or, or at least take meetings with a lot of those companies. But, you know, I would just like to, to, you know, recognize that, appreciate that on behalf of the section and what it means to those companies uh, to at least uh, that you at least give them the opportunity to take a meeting. And, and for the group, you know, um, 
I will tell you from experience that uh, when you all visit them at the merchandise show or in other ways, obviously it might be limited this year, but um, it goes so far with the relationship with the section. I've had, you know, I know there are some professionals and some maybe on this call who, who do make it a point to only do business or to start new business with a company simply because they were a Met section partner. And when, the, when that magic happens, you can't, I can't explain the response that I get from those companies of, wow, it's working. Uh, so-and-so did business with me and they cited the fact, or even if they don't do business and they, and they took the meeting, but they said, hey, I, I came to talk to you because you're a section partner. It, it goes farther than I can say. So to you, Sam, and to everyone else on this call that does that, or if I can encourage those that don't to do a little bit more of that, thank you all very much because it really, really makes a difference. Nice. Thanks, Jeff. That's great. Hey, Sam, what uh, what happened with your logo? Why the transition to a new logo? And are you uh, at liberty to say what you have chosen and, and yeah. what it looks like? Sure. So this was a decision. When I when, Let me back up a second. When I arrived in 2000, the club had their centennial in 1996, and they created a special logo for the centennial. It was a shield. It kind of, I guess, more closely mirrored a, a Pine Valley-esque type shield. And it was very controversial. And um, so I, I kind of entered at a time when Roy Pace was exiting and you know the club was kind of in limbo as to what logo they were gonna use. And was this only for the centennial and, and how do we go forward from here? And we had this very kind of ornate, complicated uh, shield logo uh, that was again, very difficult to work with, but over time, I, I decided it was going to be a one color logo. We refined it a little bit through digitization and we made it made it work. Um, well, long and short of that, that wasn't actually our um, initial logo, our first logo. Everybody thought it was because it was kind of old and regal and, and it looked like it had been around you know, for 100 years. But um, so the club had done a little bit of renovation work. They kind of updated our inside of our kind of Spanish Mediterranean style clubhouse, but it wasn't kind of tr traditional clubby, but um, it was a little more progressive. And we, last year we had our 125th anniversary. So we'd been working on our website with a marketing branding company out of New York. And that company um, was really kind of defined by their work and website architecture and so forth. But because they had this branding component, you know, they tried to tie that in. And after about 18 months, they really had, I kind of spun their wheels. I didn't really like it. It's a very fine line trying to kind of get involved um, in something that's so personal to a club. So I really tried to keep it at arm's length, but, you know, offer my opinion diplomatically where, when appropriate. And um, so after about 18 months and they were ready to go live with this and it was a logo that what I'd say looked great on a menu, looked great on a website, looked great on a flag, but looked terrible on apparel. And I was frightened by the fact that they might move forward with this. And I asked them to, you know, again, this is 2020. So this is like the summer of 2020. So we're still very much in the COVID world. And I asked them to hit pause and I said, I would ask you to at least do some due diligence here and speak to one of the foremost logo and branding uh, individuals in golf. And that was Lee Wybranski. And Lee's done a lot of work for probably many other people on here. And he's basically refined. He does a variety of different things. He does artwork, but he'll also kind of tweak a logo or develop a logo. He has a couple different options. And so for the 125th, and again, coming out of our house committee, they wanted to make this logo change. So the long and the short is we started in September. Actually, pretty quickly, we we finalized it in uh, right around Christmas, and then we released it kind of in a, a video presentation to the membership between kind of Christmas and New Year's. And it's one of those things that you just really never know how it's going to go over because there's people that have a lot of allegiance to an older logo, but he certainly understood kind of making a logo more simplistic, maybe no more than three elements, keeping it the proper size and, and helping us with coloration and so forth. And um, 
<clears throat> and I think the real sell, the real sales job is when I put it on garments so that our committee could see it kind of in an embroidered form. When you look at a logo or something like that in a 2D space, it's very difficult. It may look good. It may not look you know, good. But again, when you put it on apparel or a hat, um, all of a sudden you really see what it looks like. And again, I, I'm fortunate because I do still own my golf shop here and it was, it could have been a really bad situation and it turned out to be a, a very positive. And even, um, the old guard, um, have bought in. I mean, yeah, there's certainly people that are not happy that, the, but we, we also made the decision at that time, John, that that was going to be our only logo because people are, is this our 125th logo? Is this a logo going forward? Can I still get the old logo? And to the club's credit, they said, this is our logo. We changed bag tags. We changed pop-up tents, changed table skirts, squirt cards. Every, every piece of branding at the club has been changed. And um, so now we're in. And again, on my end, it's been a win. And Quite honestly, on the club side, it's been a win as well. So that's a little yeah, backstory. That's very important because we've all seen logos, you know, throughout our careers. That, and Katie can speak more to this when, when she talks about some of the stuff that she does. But we all have seen those logos that just do not work on shirts, do not work on sweaters. And um, it, it's really hard to, to get somebody to buy something like that that looks so bad. So it's I'm happy for you that it worked out well yeah. because obviously it's – you know, it's a storied membership. It's 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 one of the you know the best clubs in Connecticut. So it's it's nice to see a good transition. And I think that was really a good idea with Lee. I'm very familiar with his work. And um, for those of you who might not know of Lee, you know he he's all over the uh, he's all over every major. He does a lot of artwork. You see his artwork for sale on the internet and so forth. So good decision, Sam. Well, I, and and lastly, before we we pass the baton here, but you know as Katie's going to talk about Wingfoot, you, as you go through this process, you're always hoping for, to find the Wingfoot or the wicker basket or, or whatever it may be. And it, it just doesn't work that way. So you kind of have to come to an understanding as to what speaks to your club. And there were certain things that obviously the club didn't want to just have a tree or anything that was kind of nondescript and to create Weeburn which is a small stream in, in Scottish, um, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But again, being a club from 1896, um, that date alone is powerful, kind of within Lee created. A, 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 again, it's a tough um, element to work with, which is water, but he created the kind of the stream and with, with our date and a flag stick. So it came out very simple and, and clean and, and effective. So. Uh, I'm glad to hear that, Sam. I'll have to come up and buy a little piece of outerwear here for the uh, for the spring season. We'll get you'll get the friends and family discount, just like everybody. Thank you so much. Right. All right. So uh, at this point, uh, Kirk or Katie, do you um, whoever wants to go next is we're good. Kirk, do you want to go to mix it up? We'll... Uh, yeah, I want to go before Katie, please. <laughs> good call. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank Mark uh, for coming on and sharing his information. I know that, um, you know, being with Reed, uh, he's got to uh, you know, give everybody uh, a, a really, you know, glass half full view of the PGA show. Um, I know I'm one of those that uh, never likes to skip the PGA show because there are so many different reasons why I go um, from, you know, my, my job standpoint to getting a pulse in the golf world. Uh, from a teaching and equipment standpoint, but really the reason why I go is mainly because I get to connect with people that I don't see from around the world, right? I get to see them once a year. Um, so I, I try to do my best. So something similar to Sam, I didn't lay it out the way that Sam did a nice spreadsheet, but a typical day for me in the PGA show would be one is I scratch sleep off the list. It never happens, right? So we're there from early morning. So we like to try to get um, meetings with people in more of a private setting than at the show. So we like to do different things like, uh, we like to go to the Rosen Center breakfast. They have that buffet there. That's really good. Um, we like to do 6.30 to seven o'clock breakfast meetings privately. Uh, people that we get are like R&D people um, from golf companies. We get people that have a great pulse of the industry like Tim Gills from Foresight. Uh, he's been around for, for 20 plus years in the golf business. So we like to try to get them 
you know, a little bit, you know, we like to get their guard off a little bit so that they could share a little bit more of the insights of what's going on. It really gives us um, a head start to the season and gives us, gets us much more prepared. So we'll do that. And then we'll, we'll split off. We'll have meetings. I mean, from every hour all the way until a lot of those cocktail hours. So I know Stuart, uh, Stuart was asking about um, a lot of these vendors have these nice cocktail hours and events that they have so that they can get everybody together in a setting. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen this year because most of the companies that do that are the ones that are, that are spending the most dollars. So they're usually the bigger OEMs that set those things up because they have money to spare. Um, I don't believe that's going to happen. I know a lot of the shaft companies usually do that every five o'clock or so they have cocktail hours. I know that none of them are going to be present, unfortunately. So I think it's probably going to be more up to us to try to network uh, either through your own contacts or social media to, to try to figure out and say, hey, I'm around, who else is going to be around and try to create your own groups. So uh, I know a lot of golf professionals on this uh, on the Zoom. We, uh, we started back in like 2010, but we had this group of Twitter pros, right, John? Um, and we actually called it like uh, the, the Twitter Golf Academy. But it ended up being some really recognizable people like John Graham, who is uh, Justin Thomas's putting coach. Um, we have a lot of Dennis Sales is a great golf professional, Jason Hellman, uh, Sarah Dixon. Um, so we would do these tweet ups at night on like a Tuesday where we get everybody together or on a Wednesday and we would get 50 to 100 golf pros from around the world just getting together and just, you know, it just chatting up and finally getting to see each other face to face. I think that's the really cool thing is, you know, you have, have avatars and have all these things, but real to go. Hey, that's you. It's like, yeah, I thought you were a lot bigger. I'm like, no, I'm five eight. Shut up. So uh, it's it's really cool to um to really get to connect personally on a level, of people. So um, I know there's still gonna be people down there. I know James Hong is going. I know Jeff Smith's gonna be down there. Uh, well, John Hobbins. My my goal is to try to avoid him at all costs in the show floor. Right? It's like we're like going around and try to follow me, and I try to just uh, go the other way. Um, uh, other things are like Preston Combs, who's a very good putting coach. He would do this sushi dinner and he'd invite a lot of people together. And again, it just, people are trying to connect. So do what you can to try to make the best of your time. If you are going to go and reach out to people and maybe even reach out to people that you wouldn't even think that, you know, you want to maybe spend an hour with, but who knows, they might, they, there might be something that they know. There might be someone that they can connect you with. Right. So you, you never know who you're going to run into. So that's kind of like, so my typical day would be like 7.30, breakfast, blah, 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 PG show, cocktail hours, dinner meetings, usually with some of the big OEMs. Uh, I know that Ping has always been uh, extremely generous with us. We get to meet with the R&D teams like Eric Hendrickson. Um, he would usually get maybe uh, a staffer like, um, um, oh, shoot, what's his, um, Stan Utley or different people that uh, we'd have dinner with. And again, get some really cool insight and get a better pulse of what their year is looking like and products to come. And then after that would be getting together with pros or peers that I haven't seen. So then it's, you know, two in the morning, the Uber home and wake up the next morning at 5.30 again, right? Um, so I got some notes here a little bit. Um, I just want to give an update. And I know that um, it must be a little bit uncomfortable to try to ask Mark from Reed about some of these questions because he's gracious enough to spend his time for us this morning. So uh, just an update of some of the major companies that will not be present at the show. And if you want to write it down, you can, but it's basically every major golf club company, TaylorMade, Callaway, Cobra, Ping, Tylus, Mizuno, Cleveland, Strixon, Zexia will not be at the show. They will not be a demo date either. So there will be no club companies present at the PGA show. I can't speak for Wilson. Uh, we don't do business with Wilson in the Northeast. I know they're more of a Midwest company and also in Europe. Um, so I don't know, I don't have any contact with them. Uh, other big companies, um, when it comes to the teaching side, TrackMan, Foresight, 4D Motion, they will not be there. Uh, FlightScope will, and Bushnell will. Um, I think Bushnell might be interesting because one is they are a sponsor, and two is that, that um, Foresight did design that GC3, and the unit that Bushnell has is exactly a GC3. They just put a different cover on it. They're charging less for the unit. And then what they do is they charge for different features that you can actually get on the launch monitor. So it's $3,000. We 
where the four state GT3 is 7,000, and then you could pay a yearly fee to get different kind of data at your need. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Um, if you're gonna keep the unit for several years, it's probably better just to buy the unit from four state, but uh, it's, it's a pretty cool way to get something that's very good tech that uh, is a little bit less. And again, Bushnell's a sponsor for sections. So I think that's nice. Um, Taking a look at you know what demo day would look like this year would be very different. Uh, one is dress warm because I know it's going to be really cold uh, next week or in two weeks. Predicted to be probably low in the 40s and high of like 60. Um, that happens sometimes at the show, so uh, it does get chilly. Swing catalyst will be present. I think that's a really good one for golf professionals and instructors. Um, they do an incredible job. They've got a great system. They do some really good educational seminars. So I know for sure that they are doing seminars uh, at the show. So if you could visit their booth, they do have some things set up. Um, US Kids uh, is gonna have certifications on site also. So they will be there. And that's another thing that I think is very good for uh, the teaching side for the programs. My fun thing usually at the show when I'm on the floor uh, besides meeting the vendors is really walking um, the, the, you know, walking the aisles and seeing some of these new little companies. Um, sometimes it's, it's comical. Uh, I remember a few years back, there was, a, there was a launch monitor where they put the ball on a fishing line and you hit the ball, you hit the ball, get that, John. And the ball would fly out connected to a fishing line. And based on which way the fishing line was going out, they were telling us what the club path and, the distance was so um it was entertaining to say the best but sometimes you get things like that to make it fun but other times there are some really cool little things that you just never think of you or you might say wow that's pretty cool i didn't think of that and you might get in contact with them and you might give it a try right so uh, i do enjoy just going into some of the small areas and just seeing some new ideas Uh, I know that uh, Jeff, yes. Uh, what what are you guys doing out at Pete's with you and Woody and Pete and, and the group? Um, what are you doing relative equipment at this time of year? Since, um, since in a lot regards of, to um, preparing for the season or what we're doing in business now? Yeah, prepping for the season because obviously uh, supply chains are affected around the world, right? Cargo ships are sitting in, in ports being unloaded. You know, they've had problems with grips in this past year. Golf balls have been an issue. So how do you stay in front of this at this time as, as best you can? Well, yeah, we're fortunate because we get weekly updates from every uh, vendor, every manufacturer as to what their statuses are. Uh, I can't share that, unfortunately, but um, uh, I can't privately, right? Um, so we do get some pretty good ideas as to supply, let's say, from Japan compared to from Thailand, compared to from China. Um, they are able to predict what products will be available or not. So that kind of ties into what we decide that we want to stock up for inventory. Uh, it also gives us a better idea as to what type of specs, what type of shafts and grip options that we're actually even going to offer. Because, you know, there are so many different specs that we can offer now, with shaft companies and grips, blah, blah, blah. You know, you look at fitting cart, we have, you know, usually we have probably, you know, times 20 of that or more. So what we actually tried to do is we really tried to cut down on the options. more. We, we actually didn't give people as many options. So we tried to really make sure that if we're going to put equipment in people's hands, there are either going to be one readily available stuff that we can build on site or two things that we can actually get in a reasonable amount of time. So John, what we would do in a typical session is if it's gonna be, let's say a fitting that I do, is we do the evaluation, we would test it for equipment, but we would always give them like option A, B, C. So we also have a pretty good idea as to what certain specs are certain similarities between let's say shafts or clubs. So we would try to find the best product for them, but we always will actually still test them and give an option, say, all right, this is great great for you, but this is an option B. And then we're able, we're able to give them, let's say, this is gonna be available immediately. This is gonna take, let's say three, four weeks. This is gonna take five months. And then we give the customer or the client the option as to what they wanna do. And if, uh, if the golf professionals in the section obviously can't carry the inventory that Pete's carries, right? And so do you have 
do you have inventory enough that if the professionals are having a challenge that you could work something out with them and their client and or member to help get them fitted in and in into clubs? Do you have that option? We, we have relationships with the local clubs in our area. We do uh, some in Westchester also and around the country, which is where they would actually do the fit. We would make sure to see that we have the inventory and then we would give them two options. If we can build it you know, in-house, of course, the cost is more, but we would give the professional a percentage and then we'd be able to build that club within two to three days, right, and deliver so what it does is, sure, you're not going to get, the golf clubs aren't going to get the same percentage in, in margins. But what you're really doing is you're providing the member the, the product as soon as possible. Because I know it's really frustrating for someone to get fit in June, and they're waiting until November, right? The season's done. So what we're able to do is we're able to actually provide for the golf professional the service that you're providing for the member, and everybody makes a little bit of money. Right, because it doesn't work for everybody, though. Right, so John, it, no, but you are a resource that the that the uh, men and ladies can of the section can call to. Yes, mm -hmm. and you know, I think it's really frustrating, especially for the golf professionals, because you tell somebody this might be six or eight weeks, and then you get the call next Friday to see if the clubs are in yet. Just, like for some reason, that message of six to eight weeks dissipates like within five to six days. And Katie's shaking her head because I'm sure she gets it all the time, right? And you got to handle that in a, in a very nice way without, you know, actually sharing your feelings at the moment. So that's good that, that you and Pete and Woody are, are definitely a resource out there. And if anybody wants to locate Kirk, I have, uh, I have put a tracking device in his hair, which he doesn't know about, so contact me. You know, I'll be available at the show since Kirk will be avoiding me. So you can always, you know, if you're really stuck. Thank you, Kirk. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions regards to um, vendors, um, maybe even just a little bit of, you know, how you want to go about um, carrying inventory for the year, you want to get a little bit better or pulse as to maybe what certain shafts or specs or products that you probably want to put into members' hands, let me know because um, one way you could do it is you can go on site anytime to the, to the OEMs and you can create full orders. And then you, you could actually see they're doing a much better job. Uh, what we suggested to companies like TaylorMade are, you know, if something's not available, pull it right off of the web, right? So it doesn't even come up. And I think that's a much better way than to actually make it available, build it, and then later on you get a message say, okay, we can't get anything that's gonna be three months. So uh, the OEMs are doing a much better job of staying on it so that if you try to go online and try to create an order, they give a better uh, ship date or an estimate, or they just pull specs right off. So you'll see like TaylorMade, you can't even get Nippon shafts. It's not even on the drop down, but that's better. So. I think it's also our job to make sure that we're prepared before we even go into any kind of fit or we're trying to sell members anything, especially if it's custom, that we already know prior of what we could put into people's hands because it'll really save everybody time and frustration. Hey, Kirk, it's Sam. Do you, do you actually pull those shafts from any fitting parts or any kind of fitting areas that you have just so you don't by accident pull a Nippon shaft or a KBS shaft last year? Or how do you make, is there a way that you guys differentiate that? Well, one thing we do, because um, we don't use Club Connect on our irons, right? So we actually have uh, the OEM fitting shaft for irons. So we have each manufacturer dedicated in different rooms. So we will go through with the reps and with the companies as to what is still gonna be available and what's coming up. And then we'll pull everything that's no longer available. And we might actually put it into another system. So we'll save a lot of the fitting gear too. Uh, we might create junior shafts, you know, cut them down and do different things. And we'll just make sure that everything on our wall is, is up to date. Sam. And do you think, do you see this kind of continuing through the entire year of 2022? Do you see any um, let up in this. I know demand's going to be high, and all the uh, all the uh, manufacturers are aware of that. But uh, do you see any of these kind of supply chain issues uh, easing as we go through the summer? I don't. I, I don't. I I think it actually could get more challenging. And the reason is um, the crates that all the equipment's coming on, their prices have skyrocketed to where a lot of times these companies that want to ship things over 
uh, their costs are so high that they either one, they don't ship it or they're going to air it. And then you're really going to get hammered with the price uh, increases. So, you know, it's availability versus cost. And if you notice uh, upcoming 2022, every major OEM golf equipment uh, prices have gone up. Payment's gone up $50, tailmate's gone up $50. Everyone's basically going up $50 in woods and iron prices are also going to go up probably about a good $10, $20 per club. Um, and that's because they need to make up for the fact that um, it costs a lot more to import anything over here now. I think it's a really challenging time to say the least for all of us and trying to, again, make our members happy. Also try to take a position on inventory to get it here so we have it for our membership, whether it be you know, gloves or golf bags or extra um, inventory and, and drivers, fairways, hybrids. And then, you know, again, for those that actually don't build clubs, um, I mean, I think that's a great ability to do that in this time if you actually have all the components. Um, but I don't, I don't see it easing up either. So the challenge is, is trying to make sure that your cash flow still works when you're trying to take on this excess inventory. But at the same time, on the back end, uh, if things do ease up, I think, which they may not in 2022, but you're going to have a lot of issues with over inventory um, at the end of the year, which is going to be a disaster and recessionary and, and difficult for businesses. So it's a fine line of trying to commit and buy and then make sure it's it's a reasonable amount of buy, not an overbuy. But uh, that's great. Any other questions for Kirk? Well, if anybody, well, does, we, we could circle back. If you have, do you have anything else to anything else to add or? or... Um, no, I, I just if anyone has any questions, I know Anthony uh, on the chat. He says you have a nine degree ping LS tech. Uh, we might. So, um, I'll 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 text you back about that. Um, one thing specifically, um, I know that Dave Brockmarkle is on. Um, he is on the list here, so I'm not sure. Dave, are you there? Can you, uh, can you unmute yourself? I am here. Yes. Hey, David. How are you doing? Fantastic. Good morning, guys. Ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, Dave, yeah, can, yep. you, uh, can you just give us um, maybe, maybe your insight as a rep uh, for... So, David Barmuckle is our ping rep here on Long Island. Um, he's one of the best reps you'll ever get in contact with. Um, He's here every week, <laughs> twice a week. Um, can you can you give us a better idea as to maybe why Ping was unable to make it? I know there's you know the pandemic and stuff, but were there any other reasons why perhaps that um, Ping was unable to to present the show? Oh, none that I'm aware of. No, I, the 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 email I received from our um, PR, or, you know, our marketing department was ever that's just due to concerns of the virus, especially in Arizona as well. Um, and um, uh, and so I don't know what that extended to, but whatever. But I think just being cautious, uh, like everybody is. So uh, you know, that will still still continue to support the PGA uh, in all facets that they can. So, uh, but unfortunately, they just couldn't make it this year. I think just just I wanted to be careful. So, okay, got it. What I would add is, I mean, and this isn't to discount what David said. I, I know there's a lot of virus concern amongst. PJ professionals, vendors, exhibitors, et cetera. But, you know, certainly they're using that as a, I don't want to say an excuse, but they've also had their most profitable years ever. They obviously continue to have inventory challenges, as we know, trying to get components. Um, the, the PGA show costs a lot of money for these vendors. So they're making decisions uh, on, on several different levels there. I certainly hope that going forward and, and I hope they're true to their word with Mark, because I know this has been a contentious thing with a lot of the hard goods companies over time. I hope they do recommit. And I hope I do see them back in Orlando, because I think it's an important part of that whole experience. And, uh, you know, I've had many different discussions because a lot of times they're not writing the business. So it becomes more of a relationship. But I still think those relationships matter and their presence matters and seeing their new product and I know product cycles are different than they used to be because the show used to be when they would launch all their new equipment. But I really hope uh, they all come back in 2023 and uh, 
we can kind of get this thing back as normal as possible. So if there are no other questions for um, Kirk, or if he has nothing else to add, we can uh, turn it over to Katie and, and continue through. All right. Well, thank you, Sam and Kirk. Um, you know, I want to go ahead and share my screen. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Katie Weedmar. I am one of the assistant professionals here at Wingfoot. So let me go ahead and share this screen. Let's not look at those. And there we go. So before I start and talk about anything, I just want to address the most important thing that you take away from this meeting. Um, if your membership's anything like our membership, you get asked a variation of this question 500 times. When you get back from the show, every, every member comes up to us and says, so what's new at the show? Do you see anything cool? So make sure you have an answer prepared. I've been caught to where I didn't have an answer prepared and you can only talk about so many blue and white striped shirts. So Callaway one year, they had the tank when they were releasing the Odyssey putters. That was pretty cool. Grayson had the TP. Just any answer you can come up with, just trust me. It'll, it'll help save you some time if you've got an answer for that. Um, but one of the things I like to do before I go to the show is I kind of go through these four checklists. Uh, I assess our needs, look around the shop, kind of see what areas of improvement we could work upon. Um, and kind of what the, the change in trends are. So as we know with COVID, a lot of people went from working in offices to staying at home. So we kind of had a shift in athleisure wear at, at the shop. So before, if you looked at one of our table displays, there would be a couple button downs or wovens mixed in with the sweaters and shirts and whatnot. So now um, we're offering a lot more sweatshirts and hoodies and joggers and sweatpants and that kind of thing that we regularly wouldn't have had prior to COVID or we wouldn't have had as much of. Um, another area we always kind of look at is junior apparel. What's What companies are coming out with junior apparel? The last few years we've seen companies that were focused mainly on men's clothing only. They've now opened up to ladies as well. They're now getting into the junior market. So kind of looking at what brands offer these things and then taking advantage of it. Uh, training aids. As you all, if you've ever been to Wingfoot, we don't have the latest and greatest driving range in the world, but we like to offer a few things down there. And sometimes those things might go missing, whether they be the orange whip or alignment sticks or whatever. So just while we're at the show, kind of having someone look in those areas, seeing what we need, but again, taking inventory of what we need prior to going down there. So you kind of have a game plan of what you want. Um, always looking for new, new, new gifting items for tournaments and outings. We have a Monday outing every Monday from May through the end of October. So presenting these, these outing contacts, a lot of these people, you know, they're, they're event coordinators. They don't know anything about golf. So they rely on the golf professional to come up with different ideas. So while you're, we're down at the show, we like to see what's new and different. Same thing with, you know, member guests and our own member tournaments. We don't want to keep giving away the same gifts each and every year. So checking out what's new. Uh, and again, this could be a good opportunity this year since it's going to be a little smaller scale to look at these new products and see, you know, what, what could work, what would be a little curveball than what we're used to. Um, you know, and when you, when you look at your needs, obviously our, I know our members, they have no problem telling you what they think we need in the shop or what they saw in another course. Um, you know, take into account what these people are saying, but also look at your data and realize if it makes sense or not. Uh, we, we look back on our ladies sales a couple of years ago and the total apparel sales ac accounted for like 6.8% of our total sales. So as the ladies usually are, keep saying, well, why don't we have as much as the men's? Why don't companies offer as much ladies clothing? Well, if I'm just looking at this at a, as a business standpoint, why would I want to bring in something that only equates to 6.8 of our sales? It just doesn't, doesn't work. And so make sure you, you take into account uh, what people are saying, but also assess your own needs. And, and you know what, what works best. And as John mentioned earlier, you know, we have this net, great network of golf professionals. Reach out to other pros, other courses, go in their shops, 
see what works for them, what's been you know, one of their better sellers, what hasn't been moving as well. Use it as a sounding board to kind of create your own, your own mix of things in the shop. So as I said, examine financials. We have Jonas here. Jonas, if, as I, when I was went to share my screen, I always have reports pulled up. You can look at gross margin percentage, fast, slow sellers. You can, this is all at, at, at the tip of your fingertips. So use this, these reports so you can make your own decisions because once you're, you're down at the show, um, you wanna be more conservative with your worst categories, the things that aren't selling as well, but you can be a little more liberal with things that are moving. You know, you can kind of take a few risks, but if it's something that it's gonna sit there for the next six years, that's not what you wanna bring in. Um, the PGA show does a great job of sending out the, the list of all the, the different vendors. So do your homework before you go. Um, check the website, download the app, like Sam said. You can kind of see the floor map of where you want to go um, and then reach out to the sales reps that you do want to talk to. A lot of them go ahead and reach out on their own, but be, be proactive and reach out to them for the ones you want to see and get that on your schedule and build your schedule around that. Um, like I said, if we want to look at it, junior apparel, I try to do this at the same block of time. So maybe it's a Wednesday afternoon. So I'll bop over to Garb or Grayson or wherever. And that way I'm looking at them all at the same time and I can reflect upon what pricing they've offered me, what discount, what terms. And I can easily go, oh yeah, that's what I just saw over at, at that booth. Whereas if you did one on Wednesday morning, one on Thursday afternoon, it might get confusing uh, with what you had just seen. So I like to kind of build my schedule around what's, and, and usually a lot of them are right near each other. So it makes it a little easy to, to kind of stay in that same area. But the main thing, one of the mistakes I made my first couple of years was I tried to book as many appointments as I possibly could. Make sure you don't do that. Build some time so you can walk the aisles and also give yourself time to reflect upon what you just saw what was offered to you. So then you can create your, your plan from there. So at each appointment, once you're down there, take as many notes as you can. Uh, we think we're gonna remember every interaction we have, but we, we just don't. Um, and, and by taking the notes, it's easy for you to reflect upon once you get back. Uh, don't be afraid to, to ask for a discount, um, whether it be a discount, a free logo, free shipping, whatever it is. If you, you don't know if you'll, you'll never ask, and what I like to do is bring some of those reports from Jonas down with me so I can constantly kind of reflect back on, all right, what these other companies had in the past, what sold well and that kind of thing. And then that can help you with discussing terms with these new, new vendors that you're meeting. Uh, be aware of the show specials. Um, there's, I know there's always some pretty good ones and take advantage of those if you can. And then if, if, you know, you get this great offer and it's not much, it's a, it's a lot better than what you're currently getting. Go back to your current vendors. As we said, you know, they might not be down there at the show this year, but you can go back to them and say, hey, listen, I, I met with such and such, they're offering me this. And hopefully they can negotiate you, you a little bit of a discount there. Um, I like to follow up just one to two weeks later with the, the companies that I'm interested in. Some of these sales reps will be all over you, uh, like a fumble on the one, so you, you don't have to follow up with them, but be, I always make an effort to for the ones that I want to definitely bring in. Um, if while you were down there, you did happen to write an order, I always ask for the sales rep to send me the order confirmation before I commit to it, just to make sure everything looks right. It might sound great verbally, but you want to have it in writing, make sure it's 100% accurate, or be, have the liberty to edit anything. Uh, be sure to, while you're down there, um, you're going to get a lot of items thrown at you and put in front of your face. So stick to the kind of game plan as you, as you made before you went down. Um, we always have a tendency to kind of overbuy and see all these bright, shiny things and all these sales reps are going to make everything sound great, but make sure that it's beneficial to, to your shop when you, when you're down there. If you bring something new in, you know, just keep in mind that something else might have to go out or you might need to reduce the, the inventory. You can't, you can't bring in, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars worth of things if 
those if there's still stuff sitting in, in your inventory. So just be aware. Um, like I said, assess the needs, examine financials, review exhibitor list, and build your schedule accordingly. And again, I plan to go down to the show. Um, it seems like it's going to be scaled down, but just going to take advantage of while I'm down there networking and then also uh, just getting, getting away from New York for a little bit. So let me go ahead and stop this. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask now or at the end. Um, Maybe this is Sam real quick. Um, yeah. do, you, do you write orders at the show? Um, or do you, or do you note your catalog and then write the orders following, or do you do a combination of the two? And, and, and what does that look like versus when you see them, if they come to you at Wingfoot? Yeah. So I, great, great question. I do a little combo platter. Um, a lot of our big vendors, the, the summit golf brands, the Peter Millars, the title is tailor-made. So even in a normal show, when they're all down there. I usually just make a point to just stop by and say hi to our sales reps because you know a lot of them have become our friends over the years. Just say hi to them, grab a drink with them. But I'm not even writing my big orders while I'm down there. Um, that's just kind of a brief check-in. Hey, how you doing? So by a lot of these companies not being down there, yes, I'll miss seeing them, but I'm not even writing my my big orders. This when I'm down at the show, it's mainly for you know, like me to see accessories and those tournament gift ideas, these smaller orders that I'm putting together. And, um, and, and then the, the other brands that I'm not quite sure if I'm going to bring them on, say like a ladies like Sans Soleil or something like that, I will mark up a catalog and then come back and write the order. But it just, it just kind of depends on the vendor. But yeah, for my big ones, I don't even write them at the show. We meet separately. And just because I know that I mean, I would take up a huge chunk of their time and I'd rather do that on another day when I can just solely focus on them. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I, I think that is one of the concerns I have is because I think they're probably weighing those decisions as to how much business they write versus how much it costs them to go and, and bring their, their staff down there. But I think yeah. nonetheless, there are certain things about the show that I like. And again, I will not... I typically won't write orders there, but I'll, I'll make detailed notes. But sometimes um, if there's some particular vendors seeing that in kind of that form or you're seeing mannequins dressed up or you're seeing kind of a, um, a collection brought to life, I find kind of those visuals of the show really important, kind of help me create a better buy. Um, but again, the same, the same thing, whether the, whether the reps here, whether the reps at the show, I don't typically write a lot of those orders right in front of them, but I will make pretty detailed notes. And obviously your situation is different because you're having so many more frequent drops to fill your merchandise based on your Monday outside events, as well as all the guest plays. So uh, it's a completely different animal from most every club out there, but uh, that's great. Yeah. Any other, good. other questions that maybe have come in in the chat or, or for, uh, Katie yeah, that there's a few in the, the chat, Katie. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, let me check them out. Okay, so Michael asked about how, what we say to members when they're asked, um, you know, when, when items are supposed to come in on a certain day and, and they don't and members are uh, rather they probably get a little excited about um, why they're not there. So I, I remember recently, this would have been like October, um, we hadn't received our gift wrapping boxes yet for the holiday season. So it was still October, not really peak uh, gift wrapping time. And a lady was all over me about why they weren't here, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I just kind of pulled her aside and I said, listen, we've been dealing with this for the past year and a half we're trying you know with various things whether they be the grips golf bags whatever it is at this particular time gloves i just got an update the gloves are going to be super delayed and and just try to explain to her what's going on and and when i did she was like well yeah there's there's you know the, the, the supermarkets they don't have anything and i'm like that's exactly the point so what you're watching on the news and what you're experiencing in your day-to-day -day life that's what we're experiencing as well 
and it, it just kind of stinks being the middleman, but I think if you're just upfront and honest and you're saying, listen, I'm getting as many updates as I can, but there's only so much we can do. And then maybe kind of how Kirk explained it, offer them a different solution of, all right, we don't have your option A. Your option A is not coming in for seven months. What can we do now in the meantime? Can you, do you want to borrow? Do you want to demo a club? Do you want to use a rental set till then? You know, what's, what's best for you? But it's, it's been very frustrating and it's been a little challenging at times to not lose your temper and get just, you know, want to, want to yell at them and say like, I have no control over this, but just to remain calm and just kind of pull them aside. And I think just to kind of talk with them and that's, that's been my experience, but maybe Sam, you, you, you might have a different answer. I don't know that I have a different answer, but I, I certainly, it, it's really reinforced the importance of being proactive and checking on special orders on a weekly basis. And, you know, again, that takes time and energy and, you know, if a certain staff member can, can watch hard goods, certain can watch soft goods, whatever it is. And again, you're not always getting the most up-to-date information on the website because that still could be delayed. But a lot of times what we do is if there's something that should be here or, you know, just prior, we're making sure that shipped. And again, I think that does take extra effort and there is software out there that can also help you communicate. But um, as Katie's saying, a lot of times they do want to just be heard and it is important to them because everything's kind of local. So even though it's just a golf club or a pair of shoes, but it's, it's important to them. So obviously anything we can do to try to kind of ease that, but, as Katie just said, that whether it be the supermarket or whether they um, bought a new dishwasher or refrigerator um, or trying to buy a new car, everybody's aware of this. This has been all over. But again, anything you can do as a professional or as a, as a team to kind of get ahead of that and communicate it and say, hey, I know they said August 1st, we're getting some bad information that, you know, some heads were, you know, they didn't meet, uh, quality control or whatever it may be and, and, and what, have, what have you and try to get that back to the member as quickly as possible. But again, they're certainly, um, they certainly want that as quickly as possible. And, but at the same and time- And yeah. Sam, let me just jump in really quick. Um, two things that we've kind of done this year that are this past, the past year and a half is uh, we've got a huge dry erase board kind of in our hallway right off the golf shop to where you know there's been times where we were out of a particular hat or towel or accessory or belt or whatever to where a member comes in and asks for it we don't have it but we know it's coming in we don't know exactly when it's coming in but we write their name down on the board and then that way when items come in we check the board all right mr such and such needs a th size 38 green belt we put in his locker shoot him an email to where that's been beneficial. And then another thing that's completely unrelated, but a lot of uh, vendors have started to do is those microsites. And not only have we done them for a few tournaments, uh, we've also just done them in an email blast or in the newsletter to our members. Uh, we did I Be Cool, uh, the, the kind of sun protection company. We did that in the summer, just sent it out in an email. Uh, we got about 15 orders. And again, this was a company that we've brought occasionally into the shop to where we don't have to worry about the inventory. These people can go on order directly and then we just charge them and, and make the money. And then we did it with Ralph Lauren over the uh, holidays. And again, a lot of the stuff we have in the shop, but the members were just touched that we did something different. It's all about doing something different. Dave, this is a new platform for them that, that got them excited. So they, they were able to go on an order. And then we have a lot of out of town members, which made it easy. They weren't allowed to travel a lot and they had been at the club for a year and a half. So they could go on this, this micro site, order shirts, pullovers, jackets, whatever, and ship it directly to them with the logo or without. And it, again, it took us completely out of it. We didn't have to worry about carrying any, any inventory. And they were happy that we were offering something different and new to them. So hopefully a lot of companies get on that bandwagon and, and offer different different things like that. Again, this is really not novel to a lot of people where we, where Katie, it seems like puts it on a dry erase board. We just write it right on the, the actual pre-book purchase order and we highlight 
you know, who's looking for a red, white, and blue golf bag, or who's looking for, like you said, the size 36 belt, whatever that may be. So we know before we put that out on the floor and in the inventory that we need to fulfill that, that um, request from our member. And, you know, certainly as we've all discussed and we've all experienced, and I'm sure we've been told by our, our sales reps and so forth. And back to the point of like cash flow is, you know, I've, I basically booked, 150 percent of my golf glove order uh, for at once and i did that back in october so i mean again whether that you know a lot of those foot choice stays off came now but who, nobody really knew whether it be the manufacturer or whoever they, they may come in april they may come in february it doesn't matter and i've done the same with i've got 60 percent of my golf bags that are coming um in february or as soon as they're available and i'm just trying to get at the front end of that i mean it does become a cash flow it does become a basically a warehousing question too like golf bags are not something that you just kind of hide so uh we're gonna have to cross that bridge but you know there's certainly things that and with the hard goods companies whether it be you know uh sets of irons half inch long without grips to you know, certainly probably 20 plus percent more in drivers and then maybe a little less in fairways and rescues. We've certainly bought more and I anticipate, I do anticipate robust sales as we come out of the box. Hopefully we have a good spring like last year. I know it's probably more mess than hit, but uh, we're going to be ready once we, uh, once we can. What other, there was another question oh, I think Steve had asked about popular tea gifts. I don't know if anybody has some great thoughts about that, but, um, you know, again, that's a, that's an important thing to do at the, at the, um, at the PGA show. That's been something that we've used microsites a lot to kind of give people, uh, options, uh, whether it be colors or styles or whatever, to give them the best opportunity to get what they want. Again, looking at, you know, some of the links and Kings and some of those other vendors like that are all, all really good. Anybody else can weigh in? I had a question for all three of you. As you approach the show, what are the top things that you're looking for? Like something you're excited about when you get to Florida? You want, you guys want to go ahead, Kerr? Is there anything in particular? Uh, what I'm excited about? Um, for the most part, it's just trying to find out who's going to be there, right? It's, it's, I'll get a better idea maybe in the next, because um, I've gone from absolutely 100% going to right now, I'm kind of like 50-50, um, only because a lot of the a lot of the people that you know I get to meet from around the world because they're from Canada, uh, they're a little hesitant because if they get tested, they can't get back in the country. You know, there, there are things like that that are a little bit more challenging when you're coming from overseas. So since a lot of them are not coming, we're trying to figure out different ways to have meetings with them, if it's virtual or not. Um, I'll still probably go only because I, I did get confirmation this morning that a few people that um, I usually spend some time at the show with will be there. Uh, we just won't be staying together like we used to. Um, we'll probably have our own like Airbnb kind of spots. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive if you did it with like Verbo or Airbnb where you just have like a nice private room and bathroom. You can get it for like 60 bucks a night um, there and they're right by the show. So um, they, they are available. They're pretty good. So yeah, most probably, um, I probably won't go to demo day, but I'll, I'll be on the show floor and I'll try to contact as many people as I can during the evenings or, you know, just afterwards, see if anyone has any events planned. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm definitely just, mo you know, mostly just looking to network with uh, a lot of people. I don't get to see uh, all of you. Yeah, same thing to piggy off, piggyback off that. Just, just kind of looking to see what, what it's going to look like this year. I mean... I've gone to seven or eight shows and just to see how different it'll be. Um, but again, connecting with people, seeing the, uh, the PGM schools, uh, you know, going to talk to our old directors and um, yeah, just mainly connecting with the people that I haven't seen in almost two years now. For me, I'm just looking to have a less structured PGA show. I, I, I like the idea of just kind of walking the aisles and, being able to talk to whether it be other professionals or other vendors, et cetera. And again, trying to identify some new and different, you know, potential uh, vendors for the shop. But uh, 
I just, I've been so structured for so long, it's going to be kind of nice to be a little less structured. 